This is Jeffrey Tucker with the Laissez-Faire Vodcast, I guess we're calling it, and I'm here today with Gabe Sukanek. Gabe, it's really great. You know, I, I traced my, my beginnings of my Bitcoin life to you. You know, it's funny. When we got together at um, in uh, the Free State Project at, in New Hampshire, we had a great time discussing Bitcoin and um, had a very lively dinner. I managed to purchase... A bow tie off of Jeff Tucker, which one of these days I think I'm going to auction, but I bought it for 0.6 Bitcoin, and Bitcoin was, what, hovering around $30, I think. Yeah, so I, at the time I was thinking, well, I just sold an $80 bow tie for $15, but it was used. Uh, <laughs> and now, of course, I guess that would be $100. So yeah, actually, right you overpaid. Yeah, we're at a price of $215 a Bitcoin, Jeff. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's been an interesting ride. So you overpaid for that bow tie. It's so funny to think about it. And that all happened in, in a bar, as I recall. We were sitting in a bar, and right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. shot me we a half a Bitcoin. We were having dinner that night, and um, I had said that I wanted to look as good as Jeff Tucker for at least one day. <laughs> so I asked if I could buy a bow tie, and it worked out pretty well. That was such a funny moment. Well, that was my first real transaction. Before that, you had only sent me, you know, some, and I had downloaded the blockchain. You know, it's I, I got to tell you, Gabe, that um, I see a lot of commentary online about Bitcoin, and I can tell the difference between a person who is a Bitcoin owner versus one somebody who's sort of on the sidelines, uh, mm -hmm. just just speculating and using their theoretical knowledge that they think they've learned from whatever uh, to comment on things. Um, Owning changes everything, don't you think? I couldn't agree with you more on that point. Um, I think it just really changes somebody's relationship with how they think about it because they get to actually use it and tangibly feel it. Um, when you st when you use we we've our company Coinapult, uh, we work with uh, companies in other countries and sending them a wire transfer versus sending them a Bitcoin payment, it's like night and day. Um, and you get to tangibly feel that for yourself. What I, you can't do that with dollars. Everybody says, "Oh, I have PayPal. You know, I can do everything you can do with a Bitcoin." I don't think so. Try sending ten cents to Satoshi Dice and winning fifty thousand dollars instantly in one bet. Um, people can't do that with ordinary fiat currencies. Bitcoin has real, tangible utilities that no other money on the planet has. Yeah, I discovered that. I mean, that night at the bar when you just held up your phone, you know, that one time I scanned your QR code, I, I, I began to develop my little Bitcoin, you know, wealth stash here. And it was really extraordinary. But you only have to scan a QR code uh, one time or get an identifier one time. Then it goes into your address back book. From then on, sending money is as easy as sending a text message. Right. It's literally going to your files of people and just hitting send. Um, and it really does open up a lot of new markets that literally didn't exist before. What's a little uh, funny, it, like we don't, we look back and we wonder, how do we get by with just physical mail? You know, we had to put a stamp on a thing or whatever. And now, now we, uh, you know, we all use email, we use SMS, we use Facebook messaging and text, Skype messaging and everything else. Uh, but before you know about these technologies, they're hard to imagine. I mean, after all, the Jetsons in the Jetsons, they never imagined email. Elroy was still taking physical notes home to his his parents from his teacher, you know. Um, and the first time I I engaged in this Bitcoin transaction, it suddenly occurred to me, oh, this is stupid. Why aren't we doing this with all of our money all the time? Why? What's this wire transfer nonsense? I mean, filling out massive physical paperwork and faxing things it's all just crazy yeah and the the physical mail to email um I, I, that's exactly what we're talking about here it really is taking i mean the payment system that we have now is you know technology from the 1950s yeah. um it's as old rails as humanly possible so bitcoin is building and it's not i wouldn't even just say it's bitcoin think more about don't think it's only about bitcoin it's about digital currencies right but this new railway is being built, much like going from post to email, where it's going to, you know, uh, the wakes that this thing is going to leave behind are going to be monstrous. Industries are going to change. Communications and economies between individuals is going to be drastically different. Well, you, you work in Bitcoin all the time. I mean, 
a lot of what you do in the course of your normal life is spent with with uh, uh, digital currency, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Coinapult, um, we currently help uh, bid instant process uh, their transactions. We deal with the Bitcoin side of it, and um, we're in the mid- We're actually about to be launching a new website in the next few weeks, and um, we we help. We we see a lot of what happens in the Bitcoin economy because we're working with a lot of the major players, the exchanges, and um, there there's just all new industries that keep coming into Bitcoin that it, that Bitcoin has ridiculously useful purposes. I, I loved when Mega Upload and Mega came over to Bitcoin just a few months ago because the digital economy is primed for Bitcoin growth. And that's what we're really seeing now. I'm always, I've always been intrigued about the relationship between external economics and our own psychology and our way we think about the, the world. It, it affects it so much. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the prices of things change how we value physical goods. You know, I mean, if paper towels were $1,000 a roll, we would, you know, tear them off, carefully wash them and set them out. You know, so, you know, so much of what we do in the course of our life is dictated by by economic realities. Um, so I guess my question to you is, since you, since you probably more than most people, more than you know, most everybody, deal in Bitcoins you know, day to day, do you find yourself annoyed to have to spend dollars? Do I find myself annoyed? Um, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I definitely know what you mean. It's, it's more difficult in just, a, like right now, I'm paying rent, unfortunately, in dollars. And I've asked my landlord a couple of times, you know, and she happens to be overseas. So it's a perfect prime example. I would love to just email her bitcoins and be done with the rent. Instead, I'm dealing with mailing a check to her friend who's then taking a picture. And then, you know, that's finally getting to her three or four days later. I know. And she, she missed, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent upside on Bitcoin. And I would have been happy to pay her in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I would have been thrilled to pay her in Bitcoin. But, you know, I, I guess the advantage to dollars at this point is that I know I can eventually get Bitcoin with it. <laughs> so that's kind of, it's like if I'm spending dollars, at least I'm not spending my Bitcoin. So, <laughs> well, the, I think, Yeah, I, I, I only raised it because I remember, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago I was involved and I had a, like a big Bitcoin day where I was doing a lot of Bitcoin, buying this and buying that. And then I got into a cab and I, and I took it across town. And and it annoyed me to have to you know, you know, pull out cash. And right. I when you th- when you think of a Q, you know what really annoys me, especially with QR codes and being able to pay with, with your phone. If I'm out to dinner with ten friends, the process of the check is either going to be really easy with Bitcoin or it's going to be ridiculously impossible with dollars. And so now that more and more of my friends are starting to at least own some Bitcoin. We, we're figuring out dinner a lot easier, which is nice. That saves us like twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know it's just—it's a totally different transaction process, and you know, just like it has completely evolved dinner out with friends, it's going to completely evolve larger industries as well. Now, you raised the point about you know the good thing about dollars is you get to obtain Bitcoin. So, do you find yourself too having a different outlook towards your spending? decisions with Bitcoin. I mean, we're talking about a currency that very weirdly and, and unprecedented in our, our lifetimes or those of our parents or their parents or their parents, a currency that rises in value. Right. You know, it's funny. The way that I've been treating Bitcoin lately is very similar to how I've treated gold and silver prior to Bitcoin. I tried to kind of ignore the daily noise and the daily prices and just my long-term goal be put away some gold slash Bitcoin this month and you did your job. And if I average in, because there's, I mean, you know, Jeff, I mean, the price could be 150 or $100 in the next half an hour. We right. just don't know that. Yeah. Um, it's a brand new market trying to discover a brand new price for a digital commodity that's never existed before. We don't know it's, the right price. It's going to be a, a wild ride. Mm-hmm. So if people are looking at a year to two years to five years down the line and they're not worrying about whether Bitcoin prices are going to jump by $100 tomorrow, right? That, that's the way to really treat this. You know, and part of the, part of the obsession with the prices is, is precisely why 
um, some very sophisticated observers have looked at this and said, oh, well, this has all the earmarks of a bubble. You know, I mean, the frenzy, you know, the fact that 13-year-old kids are, are secretly taking out their smartphones during during a biology class, uh, during math class and checking the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, so it's got, it's got the the earmarks of a bubble, but it doesn't have the the institutional structure that that you would normally lead to bubbles like 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 uh, credit markets and too big to fail and these kinds of these kinds of moral hazards and these sort yeah, of things. Yeah, what I think is interesting because the the way that's being presented is people are looking at Bitcoin and you know not looking at the rest of the world. So they say, oh, okay, Bitcoin is clearly parabolic. It's clearly in a bubble. But if you just put Bitcoin, if you put dollar prices in Bitcoin and you watch it, so the question then becomes, is it Bitcoin going through a bubble or is it the dollar and you and general government debt as a currency collapsing against Bitcoin? And where, where do people really think the bubble is at this point? Is the bubble in Bitcoin or is it in government assets, government currency? Mm. And if you if people look at it through a different lens, sure, there's going to be corrections as Bitcoin heads to who knows what price. There's right. always going to be corrections. But where is the true bubble at this point? I mean, if you walked around on the street, is Bitcoin an over-owned asset? I mean, that's that's almost silly. You, you know, if you bump into one out of every 100 people that owns a fraction of a Bitcoin, I'd be surprised. Yeah, I think you make a very interesting point. I mean, in a way, yeah, the dollar is way too valuable in a sense because it's the, been the only option. Right. I mean, Jeff, you've practiced using Bitcoin in daily life. And when people realize they can use it in daily transactions and even hedge against the Bitcoin prices, because that's going to come. There's going to be a wallet service that lets you put in $100 of Bitcoin and its value doesn't fluctuate. It'll just stay perfectly hedged. So when people can do that, and it's the same thing as owning dollars, except you don't have to rely on a bank. I mean, why, why wouldn't everybody use Bitcoin? Uh, could you back up just a second and explain that to me again? I... Yeah, well, the con everybody's worried about the price of Bitcoin. Right. The answer is the price is totally irrelevant. Let's, let's pretend Bitcoin isn't a currency, and it's only a transaction payment processor. So it's like teleporting for money. Just imagine you're teleporting dollars. Now, let's say you have a, a, a Bitcoin company that says, listen, you can deposit all your money with us. Your private keys are perfectly safe. They're going to be insured. And if you put in $1,000, it'll be $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. But you can hedge yourself in the futures and options markets so that its value always stays the same or its value is 10% hedged against Bitcoin, or whatever percentage you want. So, Jeff, you have an $100,000 bank account, let's say, right? and you want to move the whole thing to Bitcoin, but you only want 5% of that currency exposure. So you're going to be 95% dollar, 5% Bitcoin okay. in terms of exposure. I mean, you can still do your day-to-day living expense, you can go to the grocery store and still use a debit card on that and still pay in dollars but be owning but your your actual tangible assets are in Bitcoin. I see. Now do such uh, services exist now or are they emerging? They're, they're being slowly developed. Yeah. So the futures markets are kind of taking their time. They're still early but they're gaining ground. The e-wallets are improving, improving more and more, and within the next six to twelve months, you will have a fully insured Bitcoin wallet. So just as just as somebody could put two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank and be insured, right. you could put that into a Bitcoin wallet and be insured for that value. You know, one of the th questions that keeps coming back up at, uh, 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 in interviews. In fact, I just did one this morning. Um, People are very worried about the security of, of Bitcoin. Uh, do you, do you, are you concerned that if too many institutions get involved in these kinds of services that you describe, that there'll be one or two sort of bad eggs, you know, that'll steal people's money? You know, I mean, that's already happened, has it? I mean, we've seen that in the Bitcoin world. Uh, but that's part of evolving. So, I mean, as these companies become more and more mature, 
I mean, somebody who wants to get insured is going to be dealing with like a major, you know, mainstream institution. They're going to have to be, they're going to have to show their books. They're, they're going to be pretty, pretty transparent. And, um, sure there have been, and probably will be companies that will keep stealing people's Bitcoins, but I mean, kind of just like MF Global stole people's dollars. I mean, that's going to keep happening too. Right. Why is there a need for insurance? I mean, it seems like there's such a strict system that connects, you know, the unit of BTC with particular uh, identifiers. Um, it's it's a physical well, relationship. I mean, I mean, imagine. I mean, let's say you're an exchange and your entire computer system blows up. Um, I mean, there's always ridiculously unforeseen okay. events. I think. So why wouldn't you be insured for yeah, that? I mean, I if people know for 100% certainty that even if their Bitcoins are launched off the planet, they're going to get paid the U.S. dollar equivalent value? Yeah. I mean... Okay, but, I, but Gabe, how, do you, how, how would you insure? I mean, doesn't a company that's providing that insurance have to possess enough to cover all existing deposits? Yeah, well, what's it? I mean, in ter just like they could insure gold bullion. One of the one of the things that I've that I've noticed since I've been dealing with this stuff, uh, I'll tell you something that happened to me the other day, because um, usually the way I transmit Bitcoin to a person I hadn't I don't to a wallet that I've not previously had contact with is we do Skype like this and I mm -hmm. just scan the QR code and send it off. Uh, but this time um, I didn't quite scan the code, the, the, the connection wasn't there. It was a little fuzzy, it was a little blurry, or whatever, but I thought it had scanned. So when I sent the money, I actually sent it to the wrong person because the old identifier was cached. Interesting. Yeah. So, and I realized this because I looked at my transaction record and the person who got the money wrote me and said, uh, you know, thanks for the tip, but you know, <laughs> what was the point of that? And I realized I actually sent it to the wrong person. But it kind of freaked me out there for a second because I thought, you know, the software is really in its infancy. You know, uh, it's true. Uh, because that is true. in most, you know, I mean, it took a while for emails for people to get used to email too. I mean, people were sending emails to the wrong people. There's whole novels based on this idea, you know, they right. like, seeing people, whatever. But we're at that stage right now where it's, it's kind of like user mistake prone in a way. Um, I don't know if I can disagree with that. It's definitely early technology. I mean, considering it's only been around for four, four and a half years, and um, people are just starting to really pick up on it en masse, it is what it is. But what's encouraging is clearly the money is coming into the sector for e-wallets to become more developed, for exchanges to become more sophisticated. Um, so, I, you know, I just personally take a longer term view of it and I'm very, very nervous about any Bitcoins that I'm sending or receiving and try to make sure that I play my risk right. Well, I, that's the thing. I learned my lesson. I mean, this is, this, it's funny, isn't it? People, people about, about new technology. I've just, you know, I've been working for so many years with people who are, are trying to get into whatever the technology is. I mean, I mean, you could, you know, whatever it is, if it's a smartphone or even if it's a flat screen TV or whatever kind of technology it is, people have a strange expectation that it should work perfectly right out of the box. Like everything should be convenient and easy 
and perfect. And if the slightest little thing goes wrong, people are sort of there's a segment of the population that's emotionally ready they're, to just right, bail out. Put off by it, yeah. yeah, I remember the first time my father I, I introduced him to this thing called the internet and uh, sh showed him how to search, and he immediately searched the topic of his own dissertation. Uh, in which he was a hyper specialist. We're talking about like 1997 or something like that, and he came up with nothing and went, well, you know, <laughs> you know, very funny. It's just funny right. how people people are. I I expect that this is going to happen, you know, with Bitcoin. That um, in fact, it, it makes me slightly nervous because young people I've noticed are really adept at understanding this because they kind of live in the digital world. I mean, they understand, you know, what a Bitcoin is or they. It's just they don't have any mental barriers, right. you know. But older people, you know, it takes a long time to wrap their brains around it. And you know, I'm, I, I think everybody should get involved, but not really. You know, I mean, it seems like we it, could wait a little longer. Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, my grandmother still has problems using email, right? And she, you know, yeah. gets confused with that. So it's going to be understandable, and people are going to notice that. Um, but I mean, eventually, those are going to be the late adopters. I mean, it's yeah. not like it's not like me and you don't watch YouTube because Grandma still can't figure it out. They're just going to be later to the game, and that's kind of just what you expect. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I were, you know, at retirement age in my eighties or nineties, would I throw all my life savings and try to start learning Bitcoin right away? Probably not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, but that's we've, how we've seen works. this again and again. And have you noticed this? And I actually said this somewhere just this morning that a lot of the debunkers of, of, of Bitcoins, the people who kind of, you know, say, oh, it's about, you know, it's a pyramid scheme. It's this, it's a CIA plot, it's a, it's worthless, it's all just a scam. Um, the, a lot of their language sounds kind of like what all the intellectuals in the establishment used to say about the internet itself between about 1995 and 2005. Oh, it's a big waste of time. It's just all this frifery. It's just silly. It doesn't amount to anything. It'll never be commercially viable and so on and so on. Yeah, I was actually just watching a YouTube clip of, um, I think it was like a Fox News show from 1994 talking about, you know, this internet thing. Yeah, I think it's like computers talk to each other or something. And there's this big big network so and, and they sound exactly uh, it's funny because you play it back to back with everybody talking about bitcoin these days yeah. and it sounds like the same conversation totally. well isn't it funny gabe i mean it's, it's it's funny to me because um people can be wrong wrong and wrong again for decades and still continue to be wrong you know it's like <laughs> they they never I mean, there, there's learned. a reason I only turn on mainstream television to listen to, you know, like the latest Bloomberg spot. So yeah, it's not. Yeah, uh, yeah, they, yeah. No, they, I don't know how they make a living doing it, but. So tell me, uh, just quickly before we wrap up, um, about your company, and it's called Coin a Pult. Coin a Pult, much like a catapult, except okay. we're we're sending your bitcoins back and forth through a coin a pult. Um, yeah, we. Uh, we currently do processing for BitInstant, helping them move their Bitcoin funds, and um, we're going to be launching a brand new site in just the next few weeks, and I'm hoping uh, maybe me and you can get together and do it. Maybe I'll interview you, and we'll have you on and test out our wallet. That'd We'd be love great. To have you. Oh, so you have a wallet, a smartphone wallet? Yeah, but it's it's gonna we're gonna have an Android right. We're gonna have an app version. It's gonna be okay. basically a e wallet. You can buy and sell Bitcoins there, okay. and merchants will be able to process uh, Bitcoin payments there. So we're going to be kind of an all-services-included Bitcoin hub. And, um, nice. yeah, we're going to have e-wallets available for Androids, phones, iPhones, computers, all the above. And uh, we'd be happy to have you on. We'd love to interview you. When did you start writing the software, and how, how long has it taken you? So Ira, uh, Ira Miller is our chief technology officer and one of our co-founders. He's been working on uh, the Coinapult software for, it's got to be at least a year and a half, two years. Now, I met like Ira, is that right? I met him? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a redhead. He was with us at dinner and okay. uh, brilliant, brilliant guy, smart yeah. mind. And um, yeah, he's been very successful putting together the Coinapult software and we're very excited for our launch. Okay. 
Well, good. Well, we'll talk then, and thank you, Gabriel, for uh, <clears throat> for visiting me with me today. And I'm I'm glad that that uh, that bow tie exists, and you've got it right there. It does exist? I'm excited to send you some satoshis so you can teach me how to tie this on <laughs> Skype or something. Yeah, yes. I char I charge uh, charge a, a a lot of Bitcoin for teaching the bow bow tie tying. As, as long as it's not 0. 0.6 Bitcoin anymore, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, take care. Bye bye. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it.